purpose of this lecture is to explain a little bit to you about what administrative law is all about. Most lawyers find it quite an exciting area because it enables the man in the street, Joe Bloggs, to challenge Big Brother. In 1986, Lord Justice Wolf said, I find it difficult to believe that there has been any other period of our legal history where a sphere of law has developed in such a rapid and exciting manner as administrative law over the period since I started practice. Well, that was over 20 years ago. In fact, more than that. And administrative law continues to develop apace, with new cases challenging the law every day. So let's have a look at some definitions. And we'll start off with um, Wade, I think. He said that it's the law relating to the control of governmental power. Now this doesn't mean Parliament because Parliament in its lawmaking capacity is sovereign and therefore it's not subject to control. But the powers of all other public authorities are subordinate to the law. That's the Crown and its ministers, local authorities and other public bodies. They are all subject to legal limitations. There is no such thing as absolute or unfettered administrative power. Craig suggests that administrative law is about making sure that the administration performs the tasks that are assigned to it and that its principal objective is to ensure government accountability. So administrative law is about abuse of power. So for example, it may be in an act to prescribe that a minister may make orders such as he thinks fit, but the administrative court can invalidate it if one of the judge-made rules has been infringed, and we will be looking at those rules in later lectures. So, for example, if the order goes beyond the limits laid down by Parliament in the originating Act. Therefore, we can see that the primary purpose of administrative law is to keep the powers of government within their legal bounds, so as to protect the citizen against their abuse. Now, abuse doesn't mean malice or anything like that. Government departments may just not understand their legal position. The law they use is complex, and it's not surprising if they misunderstand it. For example, a town close to where I live had decided to regenerate its town centre, and so it compulsorily purchased a great many properties in order to put in a supermarket and cut away parts of the parkland which had been bequeathed to the people. The townspeople complained about the decision of the planning authority and it was declared irregular. Lots of properties now sit empty while they have to come up with a new plan, taking the view of the community into consideration. Now this is the usual type of administrative law case. As well as power, there is duty. It is also the concern of administrative law to see that public authorities can be compelled to perform their duties if they make default. So for example, the inland revenue may have a duty to repay tax and there are compulsory remedies for these situations. So the essence of administrative law lies in judge-made doctrines which set legal standards for the conduct of public authorities. We could just as easily call it administrative justice rather than administrative law. So let's have a look now at the characteristics of the Anglo-American system. There is no formal distinction between public and private law. British administrative law is different from other European countries, but very similar to the US. So as I say, there is no distinction between public and private law, and the ordinary courts deal with administrative law matters. But you do obviously need to note and to understand that there is what we would call the administrative court. And if you look on the screen, you will see that there is a link that you can click to, which will take you to the Administrative Courts website. So the ordinary courts deal with the administrative law matters. Not, it's not a particularly uh, higher court, let's say. It's not a higher court like you have in some countries. It 
used to be that cases went to either the Queen's Bench Division or Chancery, depending on the remedy, remedy that was sought. But in 1977, that changed. And in fact, things have changed quite radically um, recently. The cases go to the Administrative Court, which is in the usual High Court system. So have a look on the website and you can get some helpful advice there as to what it is that they do. You need to understand that the ordinary law applies to all, to everybody, to ministers, to local authorities, to government agencies, and this is just ordinary courts that dispense it. This is all part of the rule of law, which you, you looked at in part one of this course. The advantage to us is that we can all turn to the law, knowing that our judges are not biased and that they're independent and they will not be on the side of the so-called authority. The remedies are good and overall we can see that the government is subject to the rule of law, just like us. In the past, many judges that heard administrative cases were not experts in administrative law, but now that we do have a dedicated administrative court, they are becoming much more specialised. Remember, judges are plucked from all walks of life, and some of you may become judges in the future, and that would be great. Hopefully that you can see that, um, that this, is, this area of law is entirely case law, but every case will turn upon another area of law, maybe a local authority bylaw or a planning appeal. So each will be different. Having a look at the continental system and the European commu community, you will see that in most of Europe there are separate courts for administrative law that deal exclusively with administrative cases and so it develops along its own lines and isn't bound up in the ordinary private law. For example, France has its droit administratif uh, and local tribunals, which are its courts of first in instance. So be that as it may, the type of work that these specialist courts do is pretty much the same as ours, and it's also based on case law. The EU has its own administrative law, administered by the ECJ, uh, and as you know, although Parliament is sovereign, in conflict, ECJ rulings will prevail. We'll have a quick look at the historical development. Um, it started in the latter part of the 17th century, although it's actually been around for longer if we really look a long way back. Um, and we'll start with the justices of the peace. There used to be an all-purpose administrative authority uh, and their bosses were the judges of assize who went round on the circuit conveying instructions from the Crown and then they reported back to London on the affairs of the country. But by Tudor times, we had the Star Chamber. And this was so called, it is thought, because there were gilded stars on the ceiling. And in fact, this was the Privy Council. So it was made up of Privy Councillors and ordinary common law judges too. And it exercised its authority, punishing those who disobeyed the justices of the peace and replacing any justices of the peace who were not performing. So its main task was to supervise the lower courts and it was needed so that the rich and the powerful people could not evade the law. It was also able to impose punishments for things that were not against the law but were deemed morally wrong such as libel or perjury or attempting to do a crime. So it was a sort of equitable court. With this being so, punishments were quite arbitrary and without a way to challenge the Star Chamber it began to be used for the complete opposite of its original roots. In fact, as a means of oppression, sessions were held in secret with no indictments, no right of appeal, no juries and no witnesses. The powers of the state were not often challenged at this level. James I and Charles I used it, used it extensively to suppress opposition to their policies, such as in the case of one poor unfortunate who was accused of seditious libel and was branded on both cheeks as his punishment. Thankfully, it was abolished in 1642 by an Act of Parliament and it was replaced by the Court of King's Bench. And here you get the writs of mandamus, certiorari and prohibition, as well as the usual remedies if you disputed acts of justices or such state authorities as there were. And this is really when our 
administrative law started to develop. During the 19th century, uh, most of the work of the justices was transferred to elected local authorities and the courts started to extend the doctrine of ultraviaries and judicial review. In the 20th century, um, because regulations and laws develop these days at a huge pace, it became quite hard for the courts to keep pace with the vastly expanding powers of the state. And by 1932, there were a lot of complaints about the failings of the bureaucracy and decisions made under delegated legislation by ministers. Um, for example, let's give you a, a case as an example. Um, the Local Government Board and Arledge, which is, is in your notes, um, 1915, appeal cases at 120. Here, the House of Lords declined to apply the principles of natural justice to statutory inquiries, which was a new form of administrative procedure then. Uh, and it should have been made to conform to our ideals of fairness by making ministers give reasons for their decisions. Um, and you can have a look at the report on which decisions were, were based. This wasn't in fact corrected until 1958. Uh, in 1932, there was a committee on ministers' powers uh, and a report in that year made by the government committee made criticisms and suggestions, but discontent remained uh, until we had the reforms in 1958, which came after the Franks Committee on Administrative Tribunals and Inquiries. This was 1958. Uh, and we got the Tribunals and Inquiries Act of 1958. It was said that in the courts there was a deep gloom during and after the uh, Second World War. And it didn't help, of course, that executive power is paramount in wartime. And for a while they weren't challenged. And when they were, the courts were reluctant to do anything. But the 1960s was the turning point when the courts woke up to the damage that was happening and they started a steady stream of cases to reinvigorate the law. And we start with the case of Ridge and Baldwin in 1964. Um, I won't give you all, all the details on this case right now because we'll cover it in a little while. But essentially, it's about the dismissal of a police officer, and it gave us the fundamental right to be heard, the right to a hearing, the right to give a defence. Another one of the turning point cases is Padfield and the Minister of Agriculture, Fisheries and Food in 1968. In this case, words in the Agricultural Marketing Act of 1958 allowed the minister discretion to refer complaints to a committee and when he refused to do so judicial review showed that he was not allowed to use this discretion to thwart the policy of the act. It was an abuse of his discretion so this case actually centres around the milk marketing board. And another one of the, the big cases that you will see when, you, when you're doing your reading or hopefully you will have already done your reading is the case of Annis Minnick uh, and the Foreign Compensation Commission 1969. This was in the House of Lords and they said that a tribunal's decision was a nullity if it misunderstood the law and so took account of wrong factors. So this in fact was about compensation after the Suez crisis for a British company that mined manganese ore and again we will look at that in a later lecture. Let's have a look now at the constitutional law links. 